Okay, let's stop. Good to see everyone. So, uh, Dharma talk is a, a common part of our retreats here, so I can share something of my experience in the form of uh, encouraging you in, in your own practice. Um, how are you doing? Yeah? Okay. Is, is it tough? No. Little, little achy? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you're not used to silence and stillness, the body and the mind tend to resist the silence and stillness. It can be challenging. But as you adapt to that silence and stillness, body and mind, um, it's in this infinitely rich field that you draw nourishment from. So I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you're feeling it. And um, it'll get even more in flow and more uh, deeper even in the next few hours. We only have a few hours left in this, in this day. Um, so it'll get even more in flow. It's kind of like um, these retreats. We come in and we're all ice cubes. Right? We're all kind of intact in our own selves. And then doing this practice with this level of concentration and collective energy, it's like the ice cubes start to melt and the field becomes more fluid and connected between us. So that's really, it's really wonderful, it's really powerful. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I'd like to share a little bit. Um, I think what, what, I, what I moved to, to share in this intro is, is to give you something of a context of Zen, you know, with, re with respect to maybe what you are familiar with in terms of a spiritual practice spiritual tradition. And I think um, Shoen and Kaki might have talked about this a bit in the earlier session, but I thought I'd go into it a little bit more. Um, I have a question, so just, you know, the, where you come from. And, and I, I want to say, I, when there aren't as many people, we can start off where we get everybody sort of sharing why they're here and where they're coming from. And we weren't able to do that because we had so many people. So I'm a little bit at a loss because I don't know exactly where you're all coming from. <laughs> But I also know where some of you are coming from because I met you a few weeks ago in the CU session that we had. Um, so I know some of you. But um, so how many how many were raised uh, Catholic? <laughs> OK, how many were raised in a Protestant denomination? OK, how many Jewish? OK, how many Muslim? I mean, OK, how many? Uh, an, another tradition. Okay, what well, might that be? Baha'i. Baha'i. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Welcome. And then, how many kind of with maybe nothing? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Padma, you're, you're Jewish and nothing. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Right, so we, we've, we've all come from some context of what, of what a religion or a spiritual tradition, you know, might be. Even those who maybe weren't, didn't have something specific, being, being, growing up in America, you probably had an idea of what a religion was or what a spiritual tradition was because you had neighbors and friends who, who kind of did that. So I want to I wanna just talk a little bit about Zen and Buddhism in contrast to, to the religious and spiritual traditions that we that we you know, kind of have for the most part in, in, in the West. Um, and I'm making big generalizations, so I apologize about this. And we've got an Episcopal, Episcopal bishop over there who's, um, we'll, we'll, uh, I, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, so he'll, he'll keep me true. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, but I think there is some value um, because I want to bring something out about Zen and about Buddhism, which I think is really important. So, you know, in, in general, I think the way that, certainly the way I was brought up in, in the Catholic Church, it was kind of a, kind of a hierarchy almost where there, were, where there was a belief system that over, you know, stood over everything. Um, then there were some teachings that were derived from that belief system. And it kind of explained and talked about, you know, what the belief system was all about and how to how to be in accord with the belief system. And then there are practices, which is actual doing that and putting that into, into place. And Buddhism is kind of the opposite. 
it's based on the practices. It's based on the experience, right? For each of us to have the experience. The practices, the teachings come from the practices. They come from people, beginning with Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha, who did certain practices, primarily meditation, but other, other practices as well. And then the teachings are expressions of the realizations and the understanding that came from those practices. And then instead of belief, I'm going to put another term in Buddhism, um, which is faith instead of belief. And faith is, it's kind of a, um, I'm going to call it a form of knowing, actually. You could say gnosis is the word. It's a form of knowing that isn't a conceptual knowing, but it's something, it's a deep kind of recognition about our true nature that actually comes from the practices, it comes from the teachings, and it comes from perhaps even a memory or a sense around what really is going on at the deepest level within. And so the more we do the practices, the more we understand the teachings and then develop our own teachings and expression, and then our own faith, which is our, know, our own knowingness about who we are, actually grows and grows and grows even more. So it's a, it's a path of cultivating this. Um, Zen is, um, I think maybe this was shared earlier today, but you know, Zen formally was born in China and it kind of was born when the practices and teachings of Buddhism traveled from India, Northern India, where the Buddha lived in 500 BC thousand years later in 500 AD, they had been, you know, spreading from India over a thousand years. God, can you even think about these time frames? It's amazing. You know, a thousand years. Buddha lived 2,500 years ago. Been practicing Buddhism for 2,500 years. It, w it wouldn't still be, we wouldn't still be doing this if it didn't work in some way, right? Meditating and, and practicing this Dharma you know, revealing this teaching generation after generation. So the Buddhist teachings and practices kind of permeated into China. And China, one of the most deepest, I don't know if it was the most widespread, but I would say arguably one of the most deepest uh, spiritual traditions was Taoism at that time. And we say the kind of union of Taoism with Buddhism produces Zen. Zen was a very experiential, very uh, connected to nature, very much um, realizing ourselves as parts of nature, parts of the elemental flow that nature manifests, the flow of water, the power of fire, you know, all of these elements that are intrinsically a part of us and which we are, <clears throat> which we are made of. <clears throat> And that all of these elements actually are not um, inert. <laughs> They're actually animate. <laughs> and so this mind, this, this quality of mind is all pervasive in Buddhism. And what we're doing in Buddhism is we're getting touch in touch with this level of mind, of consciousness that permeates all matter and all beings. <clears throat> Twenty five hundred years of spiritual development summarized in two minutes. <laughs> so Zen, the the practice, you know, the practice comes first, um, and even Buddha said on on his deathbed, you know, be a lamp unto yourself. Don't take anything that I say, that I preach, that I teach, on my word. Okay, don't raise me up to be a god. Don't give your authority and your power up to me or to anybody else. Experience it yourself. <clears throat> so Zen really just took that um, really strongly and said, okay, we're going to do the practices that allow us to wake up to our true nature in this lifetime. Okay, there's no, there's no idea of multiple lifetimes and we're going to unfold and develop under multiple lifetimes. Maybe those exist, maybe they don't. Zen doesn't really matter, care that much about that. Zen is about this world, this life, this moment. 
So it's all here right now. So don't, don't worry about future lives. Don't worry about past lives because it's all discoverable right here, right now, if you look deeply enough inside. Meditation is just a way to do this. A very almost scientific form, almost like a technology of working with consciousness, working with the mind, working with attention, working with awareness, embodied awareness in such a way that doorways open, the inner experience is illuminated. <clears throat> So we have a, a really strong teaching in our Zen tradition, which is to study Buddhism is to study the self. Have you ever heard it said to study Christianity is to study the self? <laughs> to study Judaism is to study the self? There's, there probably are traditions in both of those that do orient in that way. But this is very explicit. In, in Buddhism and particularly in Zen. To study Zen Buddhism is to study the self. So it's not about God, it's not about divinity, it's not about anything out there, it's about in here. Studying what's in here. <clears throat> and meditation is the primary form of studying what's in here. It's a very, very um, powerful practice of doing that. That's what it's all about, studying. There's another translation of that phrase, study, that comes from the Japanese, the, the Japanese teacher Dogen, to study Buddhism, study the self. That study can also be understood as to repeat over and over. Right? So just repeat over and over and in such a way that you're really internalizing and embodying what you're doing. You're bringing high awareness to it. And through that process, you kind of lose yourself in that. So you lose yourself, you forget yourself, and you become fully present with whatever you're doing. So how many, how many of you are proficient in a musical instrument? Okay, how many are athletes? Yeah, or have been athletes in the past? Okay, so in these disciplines, what do you do? You get your reps in. Right? You practice, you, you repeat over and over and over. And that, that's how you study those things to such a degree that you get fully embodied in whatever it is you're practicing. So in the early stages of that repetition, it's very effortful, right? You get the calluses in your fingers from studying guitar. You, you, you get the pains in your body from practicing soccer or whatever your, 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 your sport is, right? It's, it's really effortful to return again and again, but the more and more proficient you get, the more and more in flow you get, the more embodied it is, it becomes much easier, much more internalized. And now what do you have? You have freedom, right? Before you weren't free, when you first started playing the violin, you know, you, you didn't have a lot of range of expression <laughs> or, or none in my case, <laughs> no range of expression on the violin, right? But, but through that course of disciplined practice of repetition, you open up a capacity of great freedom. Now you can express yourself just naturally, intuitively, okay? That's what you're doing with the study of the self in meditation. It's effortful at first, but by returning over and over again to yourself selving, <laughs> whatever that may be, however it, you're manifesting, you start to have access to this freedom of expression to be who you want to be in the moment, not constrained by ideas of who you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to do or anything like that. <clears throat> you gain great freedom. So that's kind of the fruit of this, of this study, this practice. <clears throat> All of the different forms that we do, the chanting, the bowing, the walking, the mindful eating, all of it is just a laboratory of self-study. That's, that's what it is. 
just a way of very intensely turning consciousness and awareness in on what's going on on the inside and actually finding that it isn't separate from what's going on on the outside. <laughs> right? Because so much of our orientation normally with this egoic consciousness we have is about, well, I'm me, I'm fixed, but I want to be happier, I want to get more things, so I'm going to work on the outside and I'm going to, you know, get this job or get this beautiful partner or uh, eat this food or do this drug. And then I'm going to get the happy states that I want and I'm going to get the happy life conditions that I want. But me, I'm me. <laughs> I just want to be better. <laughs> and I want more and I want to feel better. That way doesn't work. That doesn't work because we're actually not separate. And that's based on a false view of who we are as people because we're not fixed and we're not separate and we're not defined by our biography or our CV or the ideas that other people have about us or the ideas that we have about ourselves. None of that defines you. But we believe it does, you know, subconsciously, unconsciously, to some level, we define ourselves in that way. So we work on the outside in order to be the way we want or get what we want. Buddhism is totally different. It understands that we're fluid and we're undefined. So when we turn ourselves in and we, we, we see that in ourselves, then the externals change because we've changed the internals. It's quite interesting. <laughs> but we're in so much um, power to influence our own experience of our experience that we can shift that and then we can shift other people's experience and we can shift what's happening to us. Mm. Yeah. I think I'm just going to stop there for a moment or maybe more and see if, if you have any questions at this point. Um, yeah, about anything I've said. And if you don't have questions, I have questions of you. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, what does it feel like for you to be free? Because you're saying you, mm. you know, that's what we're studying for, that's what we're trying to do. I feel like I've touched it, you know, I've meditated for 30 minutes and I've opened my eyes and I feel good. Mm -hmm. But what is the long term? Like, what do you, do you wake up in the morning at that place? Mm -hmm. Like, what's, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Boy, I haven't, I don't know if I've ever gotten that. So I'm going to say you, you've tasted it, right? You've tasted that sense of freedom um, where you're not, you're not, you know, burdened or held down or somehow stuck, right? It's more of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, to be specific there, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and I, it's not like I feel great every day. It's, but the freedom is um, <clears throat> having more capacity and spaciousness around my own experience, right? So it's no, it's no longer, I'm no longer limited to um, a specific state experience, good mood, bad mood, hungry, satisfied, any of this. So oftentimes we're in that place and we're kind of limited within that place. But the freedom that we're talking about is actually not necessarily feeling good. It's having such a spaciousness that those unpleasant conditions are just a part of the overall experience. Right? So you can even, you know, you can feel really bad and really good at the same time. <laughs> and have all of that going on. That's the freedom that's available, is to have, you know, a, a broad range of aliveness present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of 
if I could. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. came, what came up for me when you, when you, when you asked that question was uh, the first thought that popped into my head was freedom from reactivity. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. being, not being uh, at the whim of the world to define how I react to it or if I do at all. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, the, the, the empty boat story is really a good one. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you could even say, well, what, what do you want to be free from? So it's a good thing to ask yourself, right? It's like, what do you want to be free from? And I asked myself that probably around your age. Um, and my sense was, I had a sense like I, that I was creating my own suffering. I was really depressed, really uncentered, disconnected from people. And at some level, I wasn't entirely clear about it, but I knew that I was creating it, that, I had, that there was something I could do about it. And so that's what I wanted freedom from, is my own tendency to create this real suffering for myself. And I, and I found that in the practice. Yeah. So you can ask yourself too, what is it that really is holding me back? What is it I want to be free from? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. What are your thoughts on the compatibility of Zen with another religious practice um, that might be more of an affirmative belief system, such as Catholicism? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm, I, I want to defer to, to Rob there, but I'll, uh, uh, he really is an Episcopal bishop. <laughs> Retired. Retired. Um, you know, it can be very compatible. Very, very compatible. Um, you know, Zen, you can practice Zen and you can practice other, other practices. Zen is the, the it's, an inner, it's an inner practice. It's an inner discipline, you could say. So as long as you're studying yourself in that way, you're kind of doing Zen. And then I, I feel like you can have that be uh, a part of any other tradition. Yeah, I feel that way. Rob, I invite you to share on that. Um, well, I do come from out of a Christian tradition. But and I've been practicing um, contemplative forms of uh, meditation for the last 40 years. And um, my teacher, four years ago, um, I mean, what, what he was teaching in terms of practice and method of meditation is absolutely in line with what I've learned and studied in Buddhist Christian dialogue. So there's no, I don't find any um, issue there at all. What I can say personally is, is I have found that practice to be um, incredibly fruitful just in my inner and outer life. It's, it's, it is practice um, and it's very consistent with what Sensei is saying. Um, there are Christian traditions that take very seriously the study of the self and the realization of the self. The language can be different. Um, it can be a different approach. Um, but my practice in Zen is what it actually always has been. I get up in the morning and I sit. And then I go about the day and I continue practicing. And I sit again. And I study. And I try to adopt other practices that will open up my own um, heart, mind, body, um, whether it's uh, acts of generosity or service to others, whatever it is, um, all are part of the same fabric. Um, and, then, and I try also just to constantly advocate for um, justice, peace, life. Thank you. Was that a, a satisfying answer? Okay. Any other questions? You said that Zen doesn't say anything about reincarnation, or is that just kind of it's up in the air? Or is, there any, <laughs> is there a book like, that has the, the theology? 
<laughs> the, the Bible on yeah. the Bible. Um, No, there, there, there isn't, you know, because of the... Uh, Zen, Zen actually quite expressly doesn't work with reincarnation at all. But, you know, Buddha, if you go back to Buddhism, more traditional Buddhism, um, there are things that the Buddha said about, about reincarnation. Um, but even he um, didn't, put, didn't put that first. You know, he, didn't, he didn't want the practice to be metaphysical in that way. Um, the, 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 the teachings are more about karma you know, which we can really practice with without thinking about past lives or, or future lives. It's more about, well, everything we do, think or say, body, mouth, and thought, the three dimensions of volitional action that create karma, create karma. <laughs> <laughs> everything we do, think, do, uh, do say, and think um, is a seed that produces an effect in some way. So to be aware of that and what you're creating is a really powerful practice that is you know, an important part of Buddhism, as well as um, atoning for what, you, what, what you've created in the past or what has been created in the past, even potentially collectively. You, know, you may be part of a collective or a generation or a, a lineage that created some effect, good or bad, negative or positive. And then you are, are a participant in that in some way. So you can atone, you know, for that. But, you know, I haven't said anything about past lives or future lives and all of that. So that's our, that's our focus in a sense. Yeah. This isn't a very philosophical question. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> what is the significance of... Uh, Knowing the proper word, the vests and the colors. This, yes. Yeah. So this is called a rakasu. Mm -hmm. We we sew these when we take the Buddhist vows, the lay Buddhist vows, the precepts. Which um, we have, we have people taking the precepts here. We have people taking precepts in a few weeks, in a ceremony. So we sew this, and the the historical tradition of the rakasu is that it came from a period in Tang. China, when Buddhists were actually persecuted, they had it gotten so popular and so powerful that then another regime came in and said the Buddhists would have too much power, so they persecuted them. So this is like a miniaturization of the robe that people would wear into this uh, miniature version that they could tuck underneath their regular clothes. That, that's the lore. I, I, think, I think it's accurate, actually. But um, it's quite symbolic. It's, we call it the chant we did earlier this morning, we say, vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. I wear the Tathagata's teachings, saving all sentient beings. And you might have noticed that those of us with rakasus, we put these on our heads when we chant that, and then we put this on. So this is the robe of liberation. And it has these uh, different parts, which um, are meant to represent a rice field, the terraces of a rice field, because it's the nurturing, uh, nutritious, nurturing teachings of the Buddha. Is there a significance to the colors? Uh, there is a significance to the colors. This is a teacher. The teacher color in my lineage is purple. Shown is a Dharma holder, so he's like an assistant teacher. That's the green. And then uh, everybody else is black with the regular. Okay. Okay, we have, we have a few more minutes, and I, I, I guess I want to say... Um, Again, how are you doing? <laughs> is, is, there, what, is there anything that's especially challenging for you? Is, is there some, is, are things opening up for you? I'm just curious to hear a little feedback on how things are going for you today. Yeah. I, um, I think I came into it with, uh, oh my, what have I got myself into? <laughs> Eight hours of meditation, straight, and I do meditate. Mm. But uh, I've really embraced uh, the opportunity to be in the space and mm -hmm. have the permission to just not speak. <laughs> yeah. It's really beautiful. Mm, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Mm, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Can I hear a few more check-ins? I'd like I'd like to hear just to connect on how, how people are doing. Yeah. Okay, and then Bella. Okay. Okay, you go first. I was gonna say I agree with what you said. Like I came into this really excited but also just really, really tired. 
and really struggling to put my energy where I wanted it to be. Like mm -hmm. when I had like such strong intentions coming into it and I felt like my tiredness like dulled that out and that was frustrating to me because I couldn't be as present as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But just being here and letting myself like fully embrace like where I am and like being here and sitting through different like sittings and like being present. Just like in this space like around different mm -hmm. people really helped me focus my attention to a better place and like say like I'm here for these eight hours like I'm going to bring my intention where I want to and like get out of it what I want to and like whether I'm tired or not like it's up to me how I face that and how I go about it. Mm. Very good yeah the power of the commitment to come and, and do it and then you're going to bear you know see the fruits of that so as Arabella described you know the, the the concentration actually builds and then it gets the body might get more and more sore you know as the day goes on and maybe even more and more tired but you're developing the inner samadhi what's called the, the energy of concentration that makes it actually easier to deal with the discomfort and the fatigue so it builds and it's a really really nice process so we've got a few more hours to have that build and you'll be able to enjoy it things are like definitely opening up it's kind of like a strange feeling mm. Like I have these thoughts, but then I'm trying to like bring myself back to it's just, just the experience, just see what you're experiencing. But like the thoughts keep mm -hmm. coming. And then earlier today, I was like looking at the floor, and like these faces just started like popping mm -hmm. up. Me too. <laughs> I kept seeing these faces, so and yeah. they just like kept morphing into these things. So many faces. And then I don't know. I've been seeing this class the other day. It was like, what is it? What is it? And that keeps popping up. And then like, what is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so you really you're opening up these uh, dimensions of your mind and your your imaginative uh, faculties, which are very powerful. Yeah, start to work on your sense experience in a certain way. So we say, don't get attached to any of that. Yeah. Don't engage with it. Just keep returning to the overall experience.